Louisville, Kentucky, the land of world boxing champions, three Fortune 500 companies, and the Super Bowl of horse racing faces an urgent issue that is no different from many other cities across America. The pressing blight of vacant, abandoned, and underutilized properties, also known as VAPs. As of August 1st, 2012, the Louisville Metro Department of Codes and Regulations reported a total of 5,787 vacant properties, including 11,983 properties with inactive water service for more than three months, which were not reported to Metro. For the past two years, an entire team of city employees, including the mayor's innovation delivery team, funded by Bloomberg Philanthropies, has been working on reducing the number of vacant and abandoned properties. Their strategic goal is to reduce abandoned properties by 40% by 2015 and 67% by 2017. He elevated this situation, problem, or what whatever how you're going to describe it to one of his top initiatives. And he has dedicated staff, money and effort to come up with whatever solutions we can. And we know that there's not just one solution. Our two boxes are going to have to be full. Uh, we we had an outside firm uh, to do what we're calling the RKG study, uh, which basically sets a 20-year roadmap out there, uh, with which we're going to meet shortly to talk more about it. Uh, and, and we have already started the process of, of, of there is, is over 100 action steps within the report. Uh, there's lots of recommendations, but the bottom line is the report says it, the mayor says, and I'll say it, we can't do it without the public help. Louisville Metro defines vacant properties as any structure not occupied or being used for legal purpose or a lot free from activity, work, or development. While abandoned properties have been defined as any property that is vacant or unimproved for the last calendar year due to failure of the property owner to maintain it within the same period. Hosted by the Department of Codes and Regulation, the 2012 Vacant, Abandoned, and Underutilized Property Summit was an unprecedented gathering aimed at addressing one of the most complex and far-reaching issues plaguing post-industrial cities like Louisville, which has hemorrhaged more than 35,000 private sector jobs in the last decade. By 1978, we had built out to the suburbs. We had, within the city, crazy enough, used our resources to allow people to move out of the city. Well, that's, that really, talk about not knowing your own interests, right? But we had already done that, so this whole infrastructure we all paid for so that everybody could live outside the city. We also, by then, were losing manufacturing jobs like crazy. And um, because we built this infrastructure while everybody was working, not realizing, oh gosh, then we could you know, sort of empty the city when manufacturing jobs, great example, um, it wasn't in the 70s, but it certainly was in the late 80s, 1900, um, uh, the tobacco uh, at, at 18th and Dixie, right? 18th and Broadway. Um, that really anchored the neighborhood in terms of middle-class jobs and the housing there. Abandoned and underutilized properties can be found all throughout Metro Louisville, but hardest hit is Louisville's West End, which is home to the city's poorest urban neighborhoods. Now you may be asking yourself, how did this all happen? Well, the answer is just as complex as the issue itself. We at MHC started talking about how there were predatory mortgage practices happening and devastating urban black neighborhoods in Louisville in 2004. And in 2004, this state was number five for foreclosures in the, in the country. And we did nothing about it because it was happening in urban African-American neighborhoods within the city. And, you know, we have research on that. And then, of course, they took those practices out. And that was, you know, that all arose when we could bundle um, mortgages into a whole separate investment product. So it wasn't like a bank 
banking on you, paying your mortgage. It was um, brokers had no fiduciary duty to the people that they got loans for. That didn't happen until 2000 and 10, I think, 10 or 11. I mean, it was a long time before we finally got a law that said a broker actually has a fiduciary duty to the person who is paying them to find them a loan. And in fact, there were incentives to the brokers to get the people who were paying them worse loans than they really qualified for. So we saw those predatory practices and then it happened. Due to the political and economic fragmentation of our metropolitan areas, vacant and abandoned properties results from the normal functioning of the housing market. But that doesn't mean we should stand aside and watch it take place. Anybody in this community, no matter what income status they're at or wherever they're located, there are things that they can do to improve their neighborhoods. Pick up trash. Don't throw trash out. Don't park in your front yard. Uh, if there is a vacant property next door to you, maybe you want to take the effort just when you're cutting your grass to go ahead and cut that. I mean, I know it doesn't seem like that's what you're supposed to do, but it's going, don't assume that the vacant property is there because whoever owns it wants it to be there. There's lots of factors. Data from the Property Valuation Administration Office shows that the result of homeowners migrating away from the urban core to areas beyond the Watterson has more evenly distributed vacant properties across the county to the tune of 6,684 foreclosures between 2008 and 2010. As demand for homes in the worst inner city neighborhoods begin to plummet, so too do the rents that landlords can demand for them. With falling revenues, the owners of such properties begin a fairly routine process of deferring maintenance, dropping services, and generally trading off immediate profits against the lengthening of the owner's lifetime of the building. Also, children of deceased parents are left with properties that they are oftentimes unaware of or can't afford due to the financial burden, resulting in foreclosure or abandonment. As Mayor Greg Fisher's administration seeks ways to combat the city's vacant property problem, the inability to hold owners accountable or even to currently identify them in some cases is a vexing issue, as 40% of owners' defendants are genuinely surprised they are still owner of record for an abandoned property. Well, there was the loss of ownership by people, and many times, People hadn't fully lost ownership, but didn't know. I, um, I was even stunned, and I thought I knew something, that we um, heard uh, people at um, inspections, permits, and licenses say, you know, half the time we tell people that they're supposed to keep up a house, they say, I didn't know I still owned it. I was served with foreclosure papers, and I owed the money, so I moved, and then the bank never moved to foreclosure. So there, there, there was this limbo period where technically that household still owned the property, but they had long gone because they had a lawsuit against them to claim, own, to claim the property to sell it to pay back the loan. So they didn't know that the bank never bothered to move forward and the banks were content because guess what? They didn't want to force the property sale when values were so in flux or have to buy it themselves and then own it themselves. VAPs impose a significant cost on neighborhood property owners by lowering the market value of their properties, which reduces their equity and thus their wealth making resale of the properties very difficult. VAPs also have an overall negative impact on communities in numerous ways, alongside lowering nearby property values, which results in a decrease in tax revenue, higher insurance premiums, and an overall decrease in quality of life. As a health and safety hazard, VAPs have been known to promote opportunities for prostitution, drug dealing and usage, vandalism, theft, arson, accidental fires, and illegal trash dumping. With all these issues compounded, we as a city are communicating that we simply do not care about its residents, and it is time we act in solidarity with cities across the nation who serve as models for addressing the vacant and abandoned property epidemic, while understanding the steps the city has taken to remedy this problem as well. You know, vacant and abandoned properties are 
I've said it before, like a cancer uh, in our neighborhoods. They, um, they drag down the value of neighboring properties. And they are a constant reminder to people living in those neighborhoods that they live among blight. And when the city is unable to respond to vac the vacant and abandoned property problem um, with appropriate resources, with appropriate legislation, um, and with appropriate urgency um, to this problem, you know, it's devastating property values in the West End. And when, when city officials don't respond appropriately, it sends a message to people who live in those neighborhoods that they don't matter. At the heart of this issue though, are tax lien foreclosure sales, the single element which binds this jumbled up mess. Louisville Metro is currently required to sell tax liens to third party investors, most of whom are located in other cities. These investors pay the delinquent taxes owed on the home and then attempt to collect an interest of 12% annually for up to 10 years. This is somewhat an attractive option for local government since it allows some portion of delinquent taxes to be collected at little public expense, and the money from these tax liens would be difficult to lose. However, because third-party investors have the right to collect interest on the money for up to a decade, these tax delinquent properties, which are often run down and a detriment to surrounding properties, sit and cannot be foreclosed upon by local government. Thus, the Louisville Metro government has less power to address properties that are potentially vacant and abandoned. It's a really difficult problem because in some circumstances, the city can foreclose on those properties, but it just doesn't make financial sense to foreclose given that the destiny of the property might be uncertain. Uh, the city doesn't want to invest thousands of dollars in attorney time and court costs and title expenses and all of those things if they're not going to be able to make money on the back end of it. And right now, the way the foreclosure process is structured in Kentucky, um, it's a long, costly process uh, for, the, for the city. And one of the things that reformers want is uh, for the city to have a streamlined foreclosure uh, alternative. This issue must be addressed through policy change at the state level. This change is possible through House Bill 200. Introduced by Representative Joni Jenkins on February 5th of 2013 and supported by nonprofits Local and NC3, House Bill 200 will allow cities and counties across Kentucky to preserve and revitalize neighborhoods while providing government with the tools it needs to restore vacant and abandoned properties to productive use, preserve revenue currently lost to predatory third-party purchasers, and protects homeowners and neighborhoods. What, what reformers would like to see happen is for the city to retain control over these liens, okay? Collect the 12% interest. I don't begrudge the city the 12% interest. I would like to see the city collect that money and use it, devote it to uh, renovating and rehabilitating vacant and abandoned properties all across uh, Louisville. House Bill 200 will provide local governments with a new way to collect delinquent property taxes while preserving all fees as they currently exist, a faster and less expensive foreclosure process for tax delinquent property, and expands power for land banks. The selling of tax liens allows investors, not the city, which owes more than $20 million in uncollected taxes and maintenance violations, to profit on these properties, while our city loses the opportunity to create the revenue it needs to maintain vacant properties and return them to productive use. Deceitful investors also have the right to foreclose and be paid before any other lien holders, including liens for building code violations and maintenance. When Metro, who is accountable to the community when properties sit vacant, sell tax liens to unscrupulous third-party investors, we sell our first-line position, putting the investors in the driver's seat as we ride shotgun. But they don't have the same responsibility. So that um, if your government and Habitat comes to you and you have a piece of property and there's a property lien on it and Habitat says, you know, we could really 
build something and sell it, and then you'd have something that creates a cash flow for you and property taxes in the future, would you forgive this property lien? It might be the single most prudent thing that a city could do is to forgive that property lien. Well, that's not true if it's some private investor in Florida. They bought it as paper. They're not evil people. They bought it as paper that's supposed to have a certain return. And they have never been to Louisville and they don't have a stake in the neighborhood, nor was the understanding when they bought it that they would somehow have to care about Louisville. Like I said, they're not evil, but they don't have the same interest as government, yet we give them our government responsibility, you know, our whole government package without any responsibility. It is time that we stop privatizing profits and ceding control of the fate of property in Jefferson County to predatory third-party investors. We need strategies that provide revenue for Metro while allowing the city to retain control of our local land by empowering the land bank to efficiently take title to non-productive properties and return them to productive use. The Louisville Land Bank, not to be confused with a bank in the financial sense, started in the late 1980s and was credited for quietly refueling the revival of the Russell neighborhood reported in 1996 through Hope Six funding. It has become a one-stop shop for lot shopping, clearing titles, and low offering prices. Relying only on word of mouth marketing, the bank is receiving a steady flow of phone inquiries from developers looking for cheap lots which sell for about $300 each. The Louisville Land Bank is a city created authority which can acquire through foreclosure, hold, manage, and or develop real property. Currently, our land bank faces many challenges in terms of the lack of resource allocation and capacity to function efficiently. It is sometimes mind-blowing that we as a city have the money to build a $300 million arena, but only one person full-time working on over 700 vacant and abandoned properties and only three board members. The desk mayor is, is, is actually enlarging that staff. We, we currently have a real estate division. It's very, very small. It, it, it has, we just hired another person at, that started the week before last, so we have two in it. Uh, and we got a position for one more, uh, which is about three more than we had before. Uh, so, so we're moving in the right direction. Uh, what we have in the land bank currently, uh, with the exception of a few parcels that we acquired in the last year or so, some of these parcels have been in there for 20, 22 years. Uh, they are properties that are just not demanded. Uh, we're trying to, to be more focused in, in what properties we acquire through the land bank. Uh, and we're hopeful we are in the process of developing a better marketing program. A clear example of what is possible when a land bank is fully supported is in Flint, Michigan where Genesee County has one of the nation's most comprehensive land banks and since 2003 has demolished more than 800 unsafe and abandoned buildings, managed the rehabilitation of 90 affordable rental units and 80 single-family homes, and sold 500 side lots to adjacent property owners. A 2007 study by Michigan State University's Land Policy Institute found that GCLB expenditures of $3.5 million from 2002 to 2005 of rehabilitation and reclamation of tax delinquent properties leveraged more than $122 million in economic benefits for the city of Flint. States like Philadelphia and Baltimore have each sought out to demolish thousands of vacant structures in the city's most distressed neighborhoods while the city of Buffalo's mayor, Brian Brown, has announced his 5 and 5 demolition plan to demolish 5,000 properties in five years. In the city of Pawtucket, Rhode Island, the General Assembly was lobbied to expand the power of its housing court and aggressively sought out institutional lien holders and made them legally accountable, ensuring that new owners accept the responsibility of fixing up their properties. This effort resulted in the reduction of abandoned and vacant properties by 90%, going from more than 250 VAPs in 1995 to 31 presently. While vacant properties are a serious and growing concern in Louisville, much is already being done to address the issue by local government and community organizations. 
Current Metro government initiatives cover the maintenance, enforcement, prevention, policy, acquisition, and redevelopment of vacant and abandoned properties. A rebound is a nonprofit housing developer of the Louisville Urban League, a separate nonprofit uh, focused on uh, the creation of affordable housing primarily in the urban neighborhoods. Uh, probably for the last three years, Rebound Inc. has been focused on acquiring, rehabbing, and reselling vacant and abandoned properties, uh, primarily in West Louisville, concentrating in the Shining neighborhood. Uh, that has transpired as a result of the number of vacant and abandoned properties that uh, have been concentrated uh, in the Louisville metro area, primarily in uh, the western part of the city. Uh, Rebound decided that it needed to focus on that because that's the uh, impetus of where our work is always uh, taking place. And it's an area of the city that uh, we wanted to make an impact on. In terms of maintenance, one program that functions as a short-term solution called Blight Out Brighten Up combats vacant properties by painting boards in bright colors, making them look more attractive, while sending a message that neighbors care and are watching. The hope is that such a demonstration of vigilance reduces the instances of crime that often plague vacant properties. Other neighborhood organizations have turned to urban gardening as a solution for vacant lots, while organizations including NC3, and the Louisville Vacant Properties Campaign have organized residents in neighborhoods with high rates of vacancy to identify and map vacant properties parcel by parcel. All of these efforts are positive steps in the right direction, but in order to cure this disease, as stated before, this must be addressed through policy change at the state level. Maybe even more importantly than, than actually voting on those issues would be letting the people running for those offices know that you're going to be voting on those issues. We got to say, I'm watching you. And I've heard what you said about vacant and abandoned properties. And I listen because this is important to me. Which is why we must contact our Kentucky House and Senate and ask them to support House Bill 200 so that we may live up to the claim of being a compassionate city.